Isn't it a true statement that all churches have the same mission, vision, and values, right? And they really are, can be categorized in two sentences. Love God and love one another, right? And you're like, okay, great. Let's go watch football, right? I mean, that's kind of the way it would work. And, and, and that's fine until it doesn't work. Has anybody ever had that not work? Do you guys love God perfectly all every day? Because I don't. And do you love your neighbor as yourself? Because I don't. Um, for example, there are these like Baltimore Ravens coming to town today, and it's like, I, I can't love them, right? And so, you know, that's a joke. That's a humor. Um, so the idea is, some of you are like, what? And so the idea here is that how do we actually love our neighbor? How do we actually have a life of love? And depending on how you grew up in the church, it's kind of like you're supposed to be a good person. You know, that was kind of the category that was installed. If you, were, if you do love, then you're going to be a good person. But what's ironic is that sometimes the loving thing to do doesn't feel really good. It might feel like it's the worst possible thing. Like, you, like if, if someone was coming at you and you knew that the right loving thing to do was to sort of surrender, that doesn't make any sense, especially to Americans. Right? How is that supposed to? What is this? And what if your friend is doing something and the loving thing to do is to intercede, to stop them, to prevent them from doing what they're doing? That doesn't feel right. I mean, that's just. So, loving is a very interesting and complex idea. It sounds so simple on the surface until we actually start trying to do it. And then it becomes a bit of a mess. Take a look at Mark chapter 12, verse 29. We're going to put these passages on the screen, zoom in on some words, do some defining again, and see how this unfolds in God's word. Because I think you'll be surprised. These are some of the passages, we, if you grew up in the church, you've heard a lot. This one, you know, there's, it's recorded in all of, the, all of the gospels, one way or the other, where someone will come and ask Jesus, hey, what's the greatest commandment? And then one way or another, depending on the context, he'll answer it with these same words. Love the Lord your God, Jesus says, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, with all your strength. The second, this is always funny because they only asked him for one, but he's not going to stop, right? It's like a good preacher, right? Let me keep talking. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. He takes the two and he puts them in one category. Puts them like one thing. You might even say one coin with two sides or something like that. So love the Lord your God with all your heart. What's your heart? I mean, everybody's like, Mark, come on. But yeah, what's your heart? I mean, I want you to actually ask yourself this question. You're like, well, my heart is kind of what I feel. Okay, I would agree with that. It's, I would argue it's a little more than that. What's your soul? And that's a little harder. You're like, oh, I don't want to think. Can't we just go eat lunch? I mean, I don't want to think like that, right? But what's your soul? You know, and you're like, well, let's put on some good music, and we'll talk about soul, right? You know, whatever it might be. You start thinking these ways. What's your mind, right? You know, no one ever, you know, it's a, people will say, I want to pick your brain about this. No, 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 you didn't, nobody wants to pick. They want to pick your mind. That's what they're after. Don't, nobody wants to pick a brain. And so your, your mind is where you're, where you're thinking, where you're pondering, where you're imagining, like we saw in the Bible Project video. And, and all of these things, and then there's also this idea of your strength. It's almost like take all of it and put it together and devote all of that to loving God. And everybody's like, I'll get right on that. Right? I mean, it's a strange thing because you might be sitting there going, Mark, I love God. I love God with all of my heart and my, my soul and my mind and my strength. And yet, how does it make you feel feel when you really think about it. Because I want to tell you a very important thing. When I start to read this passage, I don't like to read it. Because what I notice when I, <laughs> when I read it is that I don't do it all the time. And there's proof of this, right? So um, when, you, when someone is overweight, there's only one way you get there. Only one way. And so it's an example of me not loving God with all my heart with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. It's, it's an example of me doing the things I don't want to do and ending up in sin and not loving him and in fact putting my trust and my hope in whatever I would be eating or whatever I'm doing. And that's a silly example perhaps, but you all could apply the same stuff in your life. Look at this, look at this second. Love your neighbor as yourself, which would mean to treat them the way you would want to be treated. Everyone I've ever talked to, when, when I talk about Jesus, they'll, if, if they're not in the church, they're like, well, I love Jesus' teaching, 
I'm like, which teaching? And this is usually the one they'll say. The golden rule. Treat others the way you would want to be treated. And everyone would think, why wouldn't you? That would be great. Except, have you ever tried it? So, I mean, literally. So, you encounter what you think somebody else is doing wrong, and you want to, you want to intervene and stop them, but very rarely would we do it the way we would want that to be done to us. I'm speaking from experience here. I'm guessing you might have similar experiences. And, of course, these passages come from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Past, those are passages we don't read enough, but the idea is Jesus is teaching us that there's no greater commandment than these. And what commandments do is they remind us of what we ought to do, and they also make us conscious, as we learned last week, of what we don't. Take a look at John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, because it's not like Jesus rested on his laurels. He cranked it up, right? And as a fan of rock and roll music, I hope you can see the analogy. He cranked it. A new command I give you on the night that Jesus was betrayed. This is why it's called Monday Thursday, because the Latin word is, is from mandatum, which is kind of a new command. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. Now, this is not just love your neighbor as yourself. He's saying love one another the way I loved you, which is to die for one another, to get down on the floor and wash their feet. And he goes, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And I got to tell you, if I was sitting in your seat and the preacher was preaching like this, I'm like, can we move to a different text? Because I'm not feeling too hot right now about all this. I'm kind of starting to feel a little bit, mm, you know, like, you know, like this. I'm being crushed further every time you read more passages because here are more things. Because I got to be honest with you guys. I don't want to wash your feet, and nothing personal, but I just don't. Americans would freak out about that anyway. But I want you to think about what are some other examples of foot washing. And I probably don't want to do those either, if you'll allow that language. One time um, uh, when we were at seminary, some friends of ours talked about how their friends had had an apartment that they were living in, and they were just people who weren't cleaning right? They never, ever cleaned. Like for months and months, dishes would just stack. No, the dishes were ever cleaned. And you know what happens to dishes when they sit for just a few days, let alone months or years. And, and they, I'll never forget, she goes, we went in there and we cleaned that whole place. And she said, I've never thrown up so much in a short period of time. But she said, we were washing feet. Isn't that interesting? I don't, I'm not good at that kind of feet washing. What, what do we do when we're faced with Jesus' commands where he's saying, this is what you do. This is, who, this is who you're supposed to be. This is what you ought to do. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 13 because it's going to crank a little bit more, right? So, so what's interesting is they always put these passages at, at weddings and that's appropriate. Like when I'm doing a wedding, I want this passage read there too. And the reason why is because we need to all agree upon what love is. What is love? And it's funny because normally I like to highlight words on my slides, but in this case I would have to highlight them all, so I just decided to highlight none. And it says, love is patient, love is kind. See, this is what's really interesting is as we're reading this, it's, it's kind of like, it's beautiful. You're like, oh, that is the coolest thing, and I never do it. Love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy, love does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. Hey, spouses, do you ever keep a record of wrongs? Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. I hope you can see what all of this is doing. It is crushing us. Now, it's beautiful. It's true. Everyone sit here like, all of that's true. It's great. I don't do it. Why? Right? And, and that's what we have to struggle with. And that's what we have to learn. Because remember what we started off with. Our goal is to say, how do I actually love people at Tuesday at 11.34 a.m. in the middle of my week when things aren't going the way I'm going, when I am failing, even though love isn't? Take a look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Those giant words, God is love. You could replace all of that language from 1 Corinthians 13 with Jesus never fails. Jesus is patient and kind and keeps no record of wrongs. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So if that's true, and we've all agreed that we struggle in the love department, then how can we claim to know God? 
And I hope our categories are starting to crack and, and sort of little pebbles are flying off of the little walls that we hold up our lives with in the way we think because right now, this is the first of the breakdowns we have to allow to have. We need to demolish the idea that when I'm actually loving, then I'm actually good. No, 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 no. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So if God is love, and I know God, and I know you guys know him, and if you don't, let's talk more after worship. But the point is, is that knowing God is, 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 is how we start participating in his love. And how do we know God? Because now he's going to tell us how. God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. You know, we've been through this set of core values. It's ironic. Every time we study one, I'm like, really? That's just the same as all. They're all the same. <laughs> because what they do is they, poke, they point us to Jesus, which is kind of why they're core values. But they're specific applications of that on Tuesday morning at 11.34 a.m. If I am dealing with someone who has hurt me, or I have hurt them, or maybe we've both hurt each other, and I think about this cross thing, I think about this day when Jesus died on the cross. I think about what that means. It starts to change the framework by which that relationship proceeds. What happens is, is I start to say, Lord Jesus, if you are love, if God is love, because Jesus is God, if, if God is love, and he is the one who gives me the power to do this, Lord, please help me do it. Because look at what it says. He sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Now, yeah, you might say, well, I think that's just talking about eternal life. Well, when does eternal life start? It's already started. Jesus said, whoever hears my word and believes in the one who sent me has eternal life. John chapter 5. I didn't put it in your dig deepers, but you guys will look it up. I know you will. I trust you. See, this is the thing. Living through him is believing in him and trusting in him, crying out to him and, and following him. All of those things are part of this. Look at verses 11 and 12. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So that's the response. That's the fulfillment. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in in us and through us. See, it's this, and, and of course, his love is made complete in us, which is his goal. That's what that means. But here's the thing. What I want you to see, remember the video we watched on the new humanity, okay? And it showed these people that were like made out of the dirt, but then the spirit came to dwell in them. This idea that God would live in them. And when you're seeing that, it created a new creation. It made a new creation. You know, maybe you're thinking of like, oh, those who are in Christ are a new creation. You know, Second Corinthians chapter five. You know, maybe some of you guys are like that bell's ringing. And they're like, no, the only bell that's ringing is for you to shut up. I get that. But here's the thing: I want you to see that when God lives in us, He does things through us, through you, through me, and that if we could trust Him for just one second. Everything changes because we're no longer just a broken person who can't do anything right. We now have God in us, the full deity in our bodies, Paul writes in another letter. This is the whole point. It's over in 2 Corinthians, the all-surpassing power of God in our broken earthen vessels. And if we start to see this way on Tuesday morning at 11.43, I think it was 34, 11.34 a.m., you can still see it at 43. But the idea is, is whenever you see it, then that relationship has a chance. So I do a lot of, I have a lot of opportunities to sit down with people who are in relationship trouble, a variety of situations and categories. And, and it's so interesting because it's kind of like you have the cure, but no one believes you have the cure. And sometimes they believe it, but they don't know how to take it. Right, And so what's ironic, though, is I have the same problem in my life, and I sometimes don't know how to take it. And I have the same problem that I sometimes don't even believe that it's there. 
We all are in the same boat. We're all in the same situation. And meanwhile, we're constantly measuring one another based upon our successes or apparent successes and apparent failures or whatever the case might be, where God's categories are just simply asking, are you a new human? Because if so, I will love through you. I will love through you. And look at his love is made complete in us. That word complete is from the Greek word kind of tetelestai, that, that, that semantic field as they say. And it's this idea of it's the goal. It's what he was after the whole time. He wants it to happen in us and through us. Look at verse 17. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment, because in this world, we are like him. We are like him. We are not normal humans. And I know that sounds a little weird to us, because you're like, Mark, my knees still hurt. My bones still ache. I'm a pretty normal human, if you ask me. Well, I ain't asking you. I'm reading the Bible. This is what Scripture says God's Word is saying to you. And the challenge is, will we let that promise penetrate the, the marrow of our own hearts and our own minds and our own souls and our own strength and allow him to love us, to set us free from the lie that we can't do any of this. And why did he do it? So that we'll have confidence on the day of judgment. This is so interesting. If you ask, the, if you ask people, Christians, they love to ask, are you saved or not? See, it seems like God's really not interested in that. I mean, obviously he's interested in that. He sent his son to save us. Do you see what I'm saying? He's not interested in those categories. He's not interested in those categories of whether you have your ticket to heaven. Because there's no ticket to heaven. Jesus said, if you hear my voice and believe in him who sent me, you already have it. Now join me. Come with me and let's love people. Let's love people. See, because his love is made complete in us. You know how cool, you know what happens in heaven when when two people who are broken and filled with sin love one another and actually like help restore one another. You want to talk about a rock and roll party going on in heaven. That's what's going on. We see it in Luke 15 where we started our series way back in, on August 25th. It's this idea of, of more rejoicing in heaven over one who is found than one who was lost. And that is what's going on. His love is made complete among us. So many people think that the story of the Bible is that you somehow be a good person and then you go to heaven, something like that. Or maybe if you grew up in a Lutheran church, no, it's not about being a good person, it's about believing. So if I believe, then I'll go to heaven. Yay! Did you know the story? His purpose is right here on the screen that he wants heaven to happen here, now, on Tuesday at 11.34 a.m. Every Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and every other day. In this way, love is made complete in us so that we will no longer worry about who's saved and who's not saved. We will love our neighbor. Why? Because they need it, just like you and I do. Just like you and I do. Because why? We're not in the category of whether we're saved or not. We're in the category of whether we're a new human or not. We are like him, he says. Take a look at verses 18 and 19. Because this is a powerful statement. There's no fear in love. And I know you're, some of you Bible scholars are sitting there like, hey, I read the book of Proverbs, and the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's the beginning. It ain't the end. Here's the end. There's no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. Besides, the fear of the Lord is a different kind of thing. That's this, looking at God and going, ooh, I want to go with him. That's, that's the fear of the Lord. This is when you have fear about the way the Lord is going to look at you or treat you. We don't have fear from any of that. Perfect love drives all of that out. Fear has to do with punishment. I want you to hear me so clearly. Everyone listen. If you've like tuned out because Mark's sermon is too long, then now. God will not punish you for your sins. God will not punish you for your sins. That's why Jesus was punished. That's why he was crucified on the cross for you. Reject the lie that he's coming for you, that the shoe's going to drop. You're just waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? You, you, we all hear that. We all know what that is. Perfect love drives out the fear. So the only way we can ever love one another is if we believe this to be true 
And he says that. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love. How? Why? What? What's going to happen on Tuesday morning? Because he first loved us. So my prayer is very simple, that we would believe this promise. There's no punishment coming your way or mine. If you trust in Jesus Christ, if he is your Lord, and you look at him and you're like, save me, it's already done. It's been done ever since the first thought came in your heart. It's been done since the first drop of water hit your forehead, and he said, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. It's been every, any, when, any time that happens, right? Then that's when you move from death to life, and it cannot be taken. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ that is, excuse me, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can. Neither heights nor depths, neither. Romans chapter 8. So trust the promise. Believe it. There's no punishment. Just throw it out. Every time the devil comes to you and says, well, God's going to be after you for that one, throw it out. God lives in me. You tell the devil that. And I know that when I look at the cross and I see what he did for me. His perfect love drives out all fear. There's no punishment. And I am set free to love. Can we pray about that? Let's pray. Father, we pray boldly that you would help every heart in this room believe your promises, that we would see one another not as broken people, but as the new humanity, that we would see that you live in our bodies. When, when it says that you live in heaven, that that's where it's at. It's here. It's in us. And I know we think it can't be true. Pour out your Holy Spirit in such a powerful way that we would at least allow for the possibility. And let us dwell on your word this week on Tuesday morning at 11.34 a.m. Let us open some dig deepers and keep reading and grow in this gift of eternal life which started the moment we heard your voice, whenever that may have been in our lives, and continues for life everlasting. We believe all of this because of what you have done when you sent your son, our Lord Jesus, to die on the cross and rise from the dead the first fruits of the new creation. And so we pray in his mighty name, he who lives with you, lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. For more information and for more audio and video content, visit www.branson.church.